So tell us a little bit about Zechariah Sitchin, too, and what he was doing, and, uh, and then we'll get into uh, the rest of, uh, of how to get his material later. Well, Zechariah was an extremely brilliant man. I mean, he was one of the few people in the world that could actually uh, translate and understand the cuneiform text, the, the original um, Sumerian writing, which was uh, only scholarly, you know, well-trained people could could interpret and translate. And he did not have, he wasn't tied in with any particular um, organization. So <clears throat> he didn't have anything to lose as far as, you know, people chastising him for having a way out theory or putting himself in danger from, you know, um, losing his criticism. job. Exactly. Yeah. So um, he didn't start writing his first book, though, until he was in his 50s. And when he wrote, um, um, you know, when he wrote The Twelfth Planet, um, actually, it was it included his second book, The Stairway to Heaven. It was a huge, thick, monumental book, and all the publishers said no. And he received the uh, advice to actually go and, and cut the book in half. So that's when he got the 12th planet, made it smaller. And finally, only, um, you know, one publisher agreed to take it. And when it was published, they put it in the science fiction section of the stores. And that oh, outraged really? him. Oh. Yes, totally outraged him. But he figured that, hey, at least my book is out there, and people who understand good research and appreciate good research will, yeah. will un understand that this is not science fiction. It's nowhere yeah. near. But that was one of the things that uh, his first publisher was apparently afraid of, is that, you know, putting out something that the, the people would maybe be calling crazy, but they didn't understand how well-researched his material was. I mean, yes, yeah. Sitchin has his detractors but what, today, but when you're a pioneer and you're going out for the first time to uh, expose some things where others had not really been there before, I mean, yeah, Von Daniken was there before too, and Von Daniken was a pioneer as well. They both made mistakes. You know, you're, you're going to make mistakes when you're entering new territory, but the thing is they blazed trails that – now opens up and people realize there is something to this and he right. had a, and they took the hits for it and at the same time um you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater with 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 Sitchin's work i mean a lot of his stuff you you just cannot be explained without having some kind of um uh understanding that this really happened Sitchin believed that all of these early mythologies were not just stories, but that they actually happened. You know, and he uses yeah. uh, Schliemann as an example, Heinrich Schliemann, who went and he re read the, the wonderful fable and the, the story of the Trojan War in the city of Troy. He wasn't even an archaeologist, and Schliemann went out and, and just it. totally floored the entire uh, scholarly world and, and the world of archaeologists when he went out and found the city of Troy and proved yeah. it. And so Sitchin says, you know, that Schliemann was right on the money, and you can go and you can find all these other places and and actually prove that these things occurred as well. And that's what we set out to do when we started traveling the world and going to these places. Because, you know, he wrote his books. He had um, – he, what he wanted to do was – bring me along and 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 I enlisted another guy as, a, as another camera person he wanted to document all of these places that were in his books um you know visually before he got too old to travel yeah so yeah, yeah. so and we went I out think it was that uh, were you at that dinner uh that I invited Zachariah and his wife out from New York and they came out to uh San Diego, and <clears throat> we put them up a hotel and uh, and uh, looked after them, and then we went out to dinner one night with Zachariah and his wife, and uh, the, some of the people from the uh, Truth Seeker Company. Mm -hmm. uh, and were you there at that dinner? I believe so. Yeah. And we made him a deal <laughs> uh, after dinner. He said to me, "Well, because I had told him I wanted him to come out, I brought him out to." 
to uh, to uh, San Diego from New York, and I told him I have a I have a business deal I want to talk with you about. So he agreed, and he came out. And after dinner, we're sitting there at the restaurant, and uh, and then he says to me, "Okay, uh, we've had dinner, and you got a business deal. What is it?" And uh, so we talked with him about what we wanted to do. I wanted to do a 13 one-hour uh, TV or video project with him where it would be 13 hours of him traveling around the world, going to all the locations that he wanted to go to and film him and videotape him talking about his work. And then I thought that would be, that would be sensa- sensational to... Uh, to you know, to market to universities and colleges and maybe to uh, public broadcasting etc. And so uh, uh, then it was you know then we we decided that it would be good for you to go with him and uh, and some of the other guys that you were working with who were camera people and 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 lighting people and so we we put together a package where Zachariah and his wife you and other uh, other technicians went along and would go around the world with Zachariah and film him, uh, talking about the ancient prehistoric world and and his books and what he was talking about in relation to the the uh, the actual history of the human race and where we came from. What was the name of his book? The very first one was it. Uh, of uh, Wars of Gods and Men. Uh, what, what was the name of the, his first book? His first book was The Twelfth Planet. His second book was Stairway to Heaven, which, as I mentioned before, were written about the same time together. And then he came out yeah. with his third book was Wars, The Wars of Gods and Men. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what it was. But the first one was, was a, what again? The Twelfth Planet. The Twelfth Planet, yes. That's the one that made him famous. It was a very, very thick book, like you said. And basically, what was his basic fundamental story that he was uh, that he was telling us? What was what was the basis for that book, The Twelfth Planet? What was he trying to tell us? He was trying to tell us that um, mankind had a in you know the ancient past um, had a, an incredible jump in our evolution, whereby when you look at um, evolution it's extremely slow and cumbersome it takes millions and millions of years for certain changes to occur and um he uh noticed that all of a sudden we had this jump in civilization where we, we were just you know we had started cities and we were you know uh doing all of these advanced uh, you know things that you know, we're very that far the ancient beyond. people couldn't do. Yeah, you know. yeah, very far beyond the primitive uh, things that had been previously going on. Yeah, and so he um, looked at all the stories, you know, worldwide, and a lot of them match. There's worldwide flood stories. There's you know these uh, stories that um, creation uh, stories, and, creation stories, and yeah. all of that, which. Um, Cross culturally around the world are very similar, and yet these all of these places, and especially in remote areas, did not have contact with each other. Mm-hmm. So Sitchin um, started examining these stories, and he thought, "Well, I'll examine the very oldest ones that we could find." And in doing so, he was able to teach himself how to, has to how to translate this this ancient writing, and found that that we. Had the, the story of the gods were he believed were actually were actual personages. These these gods were uh, you know were were real were real. These gods yeah. of the ancient and prehistoric ancient world. These ancient gods, uh, Zachariah believed and was in attempting to explain to us that these were actual real entities. Uh, I would call them uh, EBEs. This is what the U.S. government has called uh, the extraterrestrials, EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities. Uh, and so I put them kind of in the same uh, place of what Zachariah Sitcher was talking about, that there were ancient uh, extraterrestrial biological uh, people that were here, and they... 
they go on to tell from there that, that they help create us. I yeah, think was says, the next step. I mean, he says they came here because they were exploring the um, exploring the outer reaches of the space, looking for. Um, what we would be looking for if we were to go out in space, uh, you know, they were looking to mine and find things of value, mining, and they were after gold. And he um, believed that also the particular planet that they were on, gold was very important for them. And, and in fact, um, the atmosphere that they had was dependent on it in certain ways for their survival, and yet they valued it tremendously as far as just regular. That's why we value gold gold to, to this day it's because the gods valued it so highly yes. but um they came here and they started mining this gold and there was um after a while the workers there was a mutiny because they figured you know we you know we don't want to do all this hard backbreaking work we've got um there's these primitive creatures here these um bipedal primitive men and and all but they weren't really smart enough to to take orders you know they were uh or to actually do the work i mean uh so they decided that they because their dna was a bit similar to to ours that they would do some uh genetic uh crossbreeding manipulation with, yeah, yeah. So that the, so that they would be smart enough to do the work, but stupid enough not to rebel and 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 mutiny like they had. So um, in a lot of these ancient documents, there's some things that, that show that they were certain um, mutations that were that were actually made in different you know creatures and things like that. But at and then the whole story is there in this in these ancient you know Sumerian documents about how you know this didn't work out this time and then all that. So, but then they finally got it so that uh, um, they called them originally the black-headed ones. I believe as Sitchin referred to them in his books, and um, they were um, basically we became a slave species. And I mean. I mean, you look around today, we go to our nine to five jobs. We don't, uh, you know, people are too afraid to really, um, you know, think quit their for jobs themselves. and think yeah. for themselves and live the lives that they feel they really need to be lived. I mean, there's certain uh, parts of us deep down where, I mean, we still have that uh, genetic uh, predisposition so that we're not going to rebel too much and we're just going to do what we're told and stay in line. And But we're very intelligent, highly intelligent creatures where – we're changing the entire landscape of the planet because we're now suddenly, um, as Neil Freer had put it, in less than a hundred years, like recently, we have gone from um, the horse and buggy to walking on the moon by mm-hmm. crossbreeding our genes with with a godly gene advanced to that to that degree. We've kickstarted our evolution where it's no longer a very slow process, but all of a sudden. We've got all of this uh, genetic stuff going on that is that has just blasted us into an, uh, an advanced evolutionary process, whereby we're becoming more godlike every day. And even Plotinus, the great uh, uh, philosopher, said, "Man is poised halfway between the beast and the gods." Mm-hmm. And basically, <clears throat> that's where we are. And a lot of people don't know who we are, where we came from, what's really going on here. Uh, Sitchin explains a lot of. Um, the the um, uh, what do you call it the the fighting that has gone on for centuries between the evolutionists and the creationists. Well, yes, guess, yes. guess what? They're both right because we've evolved to a certain extent, and then uh, these so-called gods—not God with you know in the singular—but the gods came down, and the Elohim, as the the name in the Bible suggests, that is actually a plural word. And although yep. the, the modern religions have translated it as God in the singular, the word Elohim is a plural word, and these gods came down and created us, and it was actually a second creation. Now, when you look in the book of Genesis, you'll see that there are actually two different creations mentioned in the book of Genesis. Yeah. Because yep, one because was the original. I've said the same thing, that the, that the mm-hmm. word for God in the uh, what we call Hebrew is uh, E-L-L. L is God, and so in the in the uh, in the Bible, especially the Christian Bible, 
When you read uh, Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not exactly what it says in the original. Because uh, if you read the, the, the Hebrew of Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say in the beginning El created the heavens and the earth. It's Elohim. Yeah. And Elohim, Elohim is a plural, just as uh, if you put a, uh, if you spell car, C-A-R, but you put an apostrophe S, it becomes more than one. It becomes cars. And so this is what we're reading, what the correct translation would be in Genesis 1-1, is in the beginning the Elohim, or in the beginning the gods created the heavens and the earth. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that would explain why in the rest of uh, Genesis, when it's talking about God, uh, God says, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Yeah, the come, word our. let us. Yeah, let us. And So who's us? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and many years ago, I talked with a, a, a leading rabbi in America. For many years, I was talking with him back in the 60s. And... and uh, he, he told me, you know, very interesting the way you said it. He said, go back and read the, the sentence the way it was written. Don't put anything into it that's not there. Uh, so when you see that the gods said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And Christians will, say, will tell you, well, see, there it is right there in the Bible in Genesis where God says, come, let us make man. And, and our image and likeness. So there's there's a scripture that shows God created man. But Rabbi told me, no, that's not what it says. It doesn't say God created man. Go back and read it. It says, and then he emphasized the sentence. He said what it's actually saying is uh, God said, come, let us make man in our image mm-hmm. after our likeness. Not make man. Man's already here. So come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Mm -hmm. And that implies that there was some kind of a cross-breeding with the the hominid creatures that were already here uh, when whoever the gods are and from wherever they have come from out there, you know, even a six-year-old child, if you ask where is God, they will point into the heavens, and Christians talk about God is in heaven. Well, the heavens is the sky above you, the heavens. Well, if, if God's in the heavens and his angels are in the heavens, then that means he's extraterrestrial. He's not from here. And so if he's not from here and there's more of, and there's, there's many of them, then, uh, then what we're talking about is in the beginning, the gods created us, meaning Somebody came here a long time ago and saw the indigenous creatures that we today refer to them as hominids or the, the Neanderthal mans. You know, in, in our mind, the, uh, the, uh, the cavemen type of idea and, and came here, looked around, saw these ancient hominids and decided to, uh, come, let us make them look like us and be like us. Let them, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And so they they crossbred with the uh the the the, the, the uh, hominid creatures that were already here and ultimately one day they gave birth to us today. And so we have come a long way as as a human creation, but we're nothing like uh, you know, the original hominid creatures from thousands and thousands of years ago. So, and that idea that, uh, that we have been able to evolve so rapidly, so quickly, within a hundred and so years, we've gone from, like you said, from horse and buggy to, uh, lasers and all kinds of high technology. And people don't realize that humans are not that clever. We've had help. Somehow or another, we have help in, in, in being able to evolve uh, intellectually and technologically quickly. Somebody is helping us. Somebody is uh, behind us, feeding us information. 
And so that was basically what Zachariah Sitcha was talking about, that somewhere in the ancient history of the human family on the earth, someone came here from another place in the universe, saw the indigenous creatures crossbred with us, and eventually probably crossbred many times uh, until they finally got what they wanted, and that was us, the way we are today. And so uh, that just opens up a can of worms as far as I'm concerned, you know, because oh, yeah. I, I, I got plenty of questions once we've established that. I got plenty of questions. I mean, there's there's a number of stories that, um, you know, I experienced with Sitchin, which, which went to show that, you know, he was not welcome in a lot of places because, <clears throat> well, for one example, in, in Egypt, we went there in 1997 and he was getting clearance from uh, Zai Hawass to get into the pyramid because he was um, had made arrangements to go up into a, and above the king's chamber, whereby um, he had written about in Stairway to Heaven how um, there is a certain inscription in, in red lettering up in there that dates the the, the pyramid or, or or is said to have dated the pyramid to its original construction date, but. For a number of reasons, uh, Sitchin came to the conclusion that this, in fact, was a forgery and that the pyramid was built far, far earlier than what is claimed, you know, for, for that. And so uh, what had happened was when Sitchin was, had shown up and had planned for months to go there and he suddenly showed up and, and, um, um, his tour guide, uh, uh, Abbas, I got to know Abbas pretty well. He was in, in charge of a um, Visions Travel Company and had known uh, Hawass, and he was trying to get um, things arranged so that, you know, they had shown up and were ready to go into the pyramid. And suddenly, though, everything got held up, and um, Hawass was heard about a newspaper article that had come out that day. And he had sent somebody into the city to get this newspaper article because he didn't want to let Sitchin into the pyramid until he read this article. And this article stated that um, the Egyptians are proud people and we built the pyramids and we don't like these, uh, you know, people coming in saying that extraterrestrials and other, you know, um, uh, other, you know, higher intelligences had something to do with the pyramid when, you know, we in fact built the pyramids and, you know, and I respect the Egyptian people, you know, they're, they're wonderful people, but, you know, most of them are still living in ramshackled huts in, uh, around the pyramid. So if they built the damn pyramid, what are they living in those kinds of, you know, houses for if they knew how to build uh, something of that magnitude? It just yep. didn't really make sense. But, um, you're right. You're right. Doesn't but, make sense at all. So this guy com comes running in with the newspaper article, and Hawass reads it, and he says, "Man, I can't, I can't let you go in to, to the pyramid with you know on the same day that this article comes out." And um, Sitchin raised a big ruckus about it. He said, "We planned, we we planned on this is why we came here. We planned this for months. You can't just say, you know, we can't go in." And so, um, um. What happened was Abbas closed the door and they talked for about 10 or 15 minutes and they came to a compromise saying, all right, you know, we'll let you in, but you can't take any photographs. And, um, that, and so Sitchin realized, well, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just be able to at least go in and, and see, see for sure what's, what's going on. So, <clears throat> so they get in there and, the pyramid at the time was was closed to the public, so this was a private um, entrance to go in there. But there were workmen in there, and they get to the top of the king's chamber, and and up in that general area to be able to go up some ladders to see these in, inscriptions. And all of a sudden, a big wooden block from up where the workers were comes falling and hits Sitchin right smack on the head and cuts his head wide open. <clears throat> Pretty much knocks him out, blood everywhere. Sitchin actually thought he was dying at the time. And he had to get rushed to the hospital and, you know, and it just turned out that uh, it's suspected that one of the workers, you know, knowing this whole art about this article and, you know, they, they weren't very happy that they were letting Sitchin in there. 
And um, Sitchin didn't feel safe after that in Egypt, and he left. And I was there with him, and he he basically he gave me instructions. He said, I want you to go here, here, and here. I want you to videotape this, go to this site, go here. You know, I'm sorry I have to leave Egypt, but I've got, I've got to go. I don't feel safe here, um, you know, and that kind of thing. So yeah, um, yeah. he left that very, uh, that very night or early the next morning. I forget which, but, you know, it's... It's interesting that, um, you know, his theories are so well supported that they just decided they didn't want to give him any ammunition to help support them, especially in light of that article. But that's just, there was a lot of other things that we experienced in many countries throughout the world, but that's just one which shows how much of a threat that he, he you know, was to, to different people and places. Yeah, well, it, it always amazed me because I've been to Egypt with you, uh, and, and I've been there three times and spoke in Egypt myself. And, uh, you know, everywhere you go, the Egyptians that we talk to, um, they they all seem to want you to understand that they are from a pharaonic bloodline, that they are direct descendants from the pharaoh and all that. <laughs> And, uh, and in point of fact, that's, it's ludicrous on the face of it. You know, the ancient Egyptians, uh, we don't know who they were. We have no idea in the world who they were or where they came from. But whoever they were, they were able to build these enormous, uh, temples and, uh, just extraordinary stuff. If you see the pyramid and go inside the pyramid as you and I have done and, um, so just to hear people who want you to believe that they are the direct descendants of the ancient Egyptians uh, is just, to my way of thinking, ludicrous. I, you know, I, I understand they want to be proud of their country and what's what's on that land, but they yeah. didn't build it. My God, I mean, uh, uh, if you dro- roam around Egypt as we did uh, continually three different times. Uh, and you probably more times, uh, you see the way that they live today in their buildings and how they live today, the Egyptians, uh, and, and if it wasn't for the, for the, uh, uh, Europeans and the Americans who build beautiful hotels and, and gorgeous, uh, lawns and, 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 uh, pools and, you know, just gorgeous, uh, resort places, but the Egyptians themselves, uh, they you know, it's, it's hard to believe that people who live like that, uh, were direct descendants of the pharaohs who built monstrous, uh, incredible uh, stuff. So, uh, I, I understand, but I also understand, no, the Egyptians of today that are there are not the direct de- descendants from pharaoh. And from the ancient ancient Egyptians. Well, the pharaohs uh, I always know, claimed. I don't even know who the ancient Egyptians were. Yeah, the pharaohs always claimed to, uh, have, to have been part uh, gods or godly blood in some certain sense, and yeah. you know, and that could have been diffused over the years as well. But at the same time, you know, they are fantastic uh, caretakers, and they treated us very well. And I just, I actually, you know. Nothing against them personally, and they, you know, it's like, and I don't know for sure. They they could very well have some lineage that's still going on there. It just it's, it's such a strange anomaly, though. That that, um, but I guess the the pyramids were built before the flood, and you know, the great flood could have wiped out that whole line of people that had such incredible ingenuity. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, when you when you see the pyramids and go inside the Great Pyramid, incidentally, that may, the the middle pyramid seems to be the larger of the three. There were three pyramids on the Giza Plateau, uh, three main pyramids. Uh, the middle one is the larger, but that's not the Great Pyramid of Giza. That's not the Great Pyramid at all. Even though it's a little larger, but it's not the great one. The great pyramid is the first one. Uh, and, and it's not quite the same size as the middle one. But that first one is a, is a dazzling piece of architecture of you. When you go inside and see what it's like inside, it's extraordinary. So, 
I just think that uh, Zachariah Sitchin's work opened up a whole new can of worms. And like you said, uh, he was always uh, uh, fighting off the, uh, the detractors and people who were trying to say that he didn't know what he was talking about. He was a fool. And talking about uh, when he talked about the possibility of there being extraterrestrial life forms who have come here from other worlds thousands and thousands of years ago and intervened in our in, and intervened in our natural evolution. I think that is the word rather than creationism or uh, or or evolution. I think the correct subject to look at is intervention. Mm -hmm. Somebody came here and helped us uh, evolve quickly and created a different kind of man. We know we can do it today. We can cross, we can cross breed, we can play with DNA and start creating different kinds of creatures and different kinds of humans. Uh, you know, that's dangerous stuff, but we know, it, you know, people are doing it. We know that, uh, there are powerful people in the world who are trying to do just that to manipulate our genetics and create a different kind of human. Well, that's what Zachariah Sitchin was talking about, that somebody came here from a long time ago, and I do mean a long time ago, and and began to uh, manipulate our DNA and pro crossbreed with us, and eventually, with enough crossbreeding, it brought us to today who we are today. We're doing monstrous things that you know, the ancient peoples and, and peoples are even today around the world are not capable of doing, but there is, there is uh, among mankind today people who can do building great bridges and great high-rise buildings. And so it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, the, the natural destiny and the evolution of the human family. And yeah, Zachariah Sitchin was one of the right people that started us thinking that way. Yeah, and he, he believed that uh, that we had help with the, the Great Pyramid, and there's certainly evidence that shows that it took a great deal of manpower to, to build them, and so the, the people of Egypt would be right in being proud of that structure because a lot of the actual you know work itself uh, was very much done by those people at the time. So that you know, they still have many good reasons to be proud. But it just seems that the 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 thinking behind it may well have been uh, come from elsewhere, according to Sitchin. So yeah, yeah, and I think that too. I've been saying that for years. That uh, I, I'm totally convinced that uh, we humans have been uh, slowly but surely being led along. Uh, a classic example that I would use to uh, to back up what I'm saying is Nikolai Tesla. When he was like 85 years old uh, in New York, they gave a, uh, the scientific community gave him a big awards dinner in his, in his honor in New York. And they invited him there. And after the uh, dinner, uh, there were speeches made and, and, and Nikolai Tesla was able to to address the audience, and he talked about how he came by having all of these wonderful, extraordinary experience uh, experiments that gave us alternative current, lighting, radio, uh, all kinds of technological advances that Nikolai Tesla has given to the world. And uh, he said, Tesla himself said, that when he would go to sleep at night, he would have a pad and pen by his bed on his night table, and when he wake, uh, when he awoke in the morning, there would be already written down on the pad in uh, in, in a handwriting not his um, of a new experiment, a new uh, a new uh, piece of work, and he would then take that pad and go to the laboratory and follow what was said and be damn if it doesn't work it would be a, some new uh some new invention that was startling to the whole whole world and today we look at all the work of Nikolai Tesla uh lighting the world and giving us radio he was the one who gave us radio and electronics 
but he said, uh, you know, he, he would go to bed at night, and the next morning someone had written it down and showed him what to do. So there's a classic example of somebody, not of this world, uh, able to communicate with humans and tell them what they need to do and how they need to do it. And and then we are making such progress, thinking we're so smart. I don't think we're that smart. I think we're being I think we're being led in our technology. We're being led somewhere by somebody. Well, who is these, obviously you know, yeah, obviously it, smarter than we are. In these stories that Sitchin has documented cross culturally, there's always these stories of the gods and mm-hmm. the hierarchy of the gods. Um, you would find their correspondence throughout different cultures worldwide, whereby, you know, a god in, in, uh, Egypt would be similar to the same one found in, in, uh, in, uh, Mesopotamia and in Central America. And they all seem to, you know, in ancient Rome, they all, always seem to have, uh, the same correspondence amongst them in the, in, in the, uh, yeah, the and so that, of the gods, so and so therefore, uh, so many of the ancient cultures that talked about quote the gods end quote were talking about the same thing as you said from Central America, Mesoamerica, to uh, South America, to uh, Egypt, to Sumeria, all over the world. The ancient peoples readily understood the concept. That there were higher, uh, yeah. higher life forms in the universe that could guide us. And in each case, they were bringing forth uh, knowledge and uh, you know uh, ways where we could improve our civilization. And yeah. each god was responsible for certain parts of the civilization that corresponded, uh, you know, across cultures like that. It's really interesting study when you get into these mythologies. Yeah, but but it also is is the very basis. For Christianity and Judaism, especially those two religions, because Christianity talks about God and the angels, the good angels, the bad angels. Well, where is an angel and God? Well, like I said, a child will tell you. If you ask a child, where is God? They'll point straight up into the sky. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, God's out there. And if you believe in angels and spirits, yeah, well, they're with God. Where? Out there. They're out there in, the, in space. So, in point of fact, uh, you know, our religions today, Judeo-Christianity, uh, you know, acknowledges the idea that God comes from out there, and He has and He has worked His work here on the earth. 